Hey everyone! Um, today for our lecture content, we're going to go over a couple tools that you can use in your persuasive speeches to hopefully um, drive your persuasive topic. Um, remember the goal for your persuasive speech is to initiate some sort of change in your audience. You want them to change their mind on something, you want them to take some sort of action, one of those two, and these tools should help. So we're going to go over ethos, logos, and pathos. Um, most of you I'm sure have heard of them before. If not, we're going to go over it in detail and then we have an awesome YouTube video for you to watch um, afterwards that should help as well. So yeah, we will get to it. Hello everyone. We are going to talk about different persuasive styles. They include ethos, pathos, and logos. This presentation is specifically talking about ethos. And for those of you who might not remember what ethos is, just need a refresher, or maybe you don't know what it is in the first place, ethos is establishing credibility and trust. One of the greatest examples of some a persuasive speech ever is Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. And one specific example of when he uses ethos in this speech is when he talks about his children, and that gives him credibility because he's putting himself in a situation that is similar to those in his audience as a parent and as someone of color. So now we're gonna watch a short video clip of this quote. Oh, one second. Sorry. Welter on them to an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream. My poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. Alrighty, so we know that was just a really short clip, but throughout the rest of this presentation, um, you'll see that it it exemplifies a persuasive method that was really effective because of his ethos. So the first great way that you can establish ethos in your speech is through sharing why you care about the topic and why you're qualified to speak about it. So in this case, his qualification and passion kind of go hand in hand in that we know that he is going through this at the same time as his audience is. He's a man of color, he has a family, and he's going through these same like struggles that he's talking about as his audience, and that immediately gives him um, credibility and qualifications right off the bat. Awesome. Another thing that helps Martin Luther King Jr. establish credibility through ethos is his posture and delivery of the speech. So I know we just watched a really short clip of the speech, but he is very confident in his delivery and he has a really loud voice and also the way he pauses gives emphasis to certain words and phrases that are helping him establish credibility. As an audience member, I know I have a hard time trusting people who don't feel confident and maybe aren't purposeful and adapted to their audience. And so I think that being able to have a good posture and delivery of your speech will really establish trust. It's like that video we watched in lecture about um, the power pose, right? You can seem more confident when you have a good posture and the more confidence you appear to have, the more your audience is going to trust you. Okay, so another way that we can establish ethos in our speeches is by acknowledging that there is another side to your argument. Um, so that doesn't necessarily mean you have to focus on it, but just acknowledge that there is one. So if you were to talk about coronavirus and you're talking about the need to self-quarantine or socially distance from other people, you can acknowledge that like, oh, it's a hard thing and we don't want to do it, but it's necessary. And that one little phrase can establish your credibility that there is another side like, yeah, it might be hard. You don't want to do it, but it's necessary. Um, so you don't have to focus on that other side, but just acknowledging it can show that you have done your research, that you know there's another side, and this is still the side that you're persuading about. Another way to establish ethos and credibility is through co correctly citing sources within a speech. So we've talked a lot about this in the class, and if you think about it, if you were to say, 
let's say a quote that just says um, the best or the coronavirus is thought to spread mo mainly through person to person within people who are in six feet of each other. And if I just said that in a speech without any citation or source, then you might not feel as inclined to trust me in my um, data. But if I instead say an author and a researcher in the CDC says that the virus is thought to spread from people to people and people who are in close contact with each other and six feet, within six feet. And this um, was written in 2020. So that, by me saying that as my source and citing it gives more credibility, especially because I'm saying it's from the CDC, which is thought to be a credible source and people trust the CDC. And although I couldn't find an author, I still included like an author placeholder there saying that it was a researcher in the CDC. And I included the date saying it was up to date. If I were to say something about the, our viruses are most likely to spread through close contact of people, this was a source from 1998, then again, it might not be as credible. But if I'm citing something that Martin Luther King Jr. said, it probably is going to be most credible from his time period. So just including the date and the name, date, and location will definitely increase your ethos and credibility as you're giving speeches. Okay. Another way you can establish your credibility is through being consistent with data and acknowledging loopholes. So you're going to want to try and find data that is consistent. Like your sources want to be showing consistent data with each other. Um, but sometimes we can have loopholes in our data. So if we were talking about a source from the 90s versus a source that is from 2020, there may be a little bit of different information, especially if it was like about viruses, like Shay was saying. Um, you might have a little bit of different information. So you want to acknowledge that time difference or whatever the loophole may be. Acknowledge that it's there if you absolutely have to. If you can find sources that are consistent in their data with each other, that's usually the best way to do it because it shows your research, it's all consistent with each other, and it just is another way to establish that credibility. All right, um, just to conclude, and um, I think that establishing credibility and ethos in a speech is super duper important and there's a lot of examples throughout history of when people have done this really effectively and especially coming into this persuasive speech where you're trying to persuade your audience to do something for example if your audience finds a loophole in your argument then they're not going to trust the rest of your speech even if it was one tiny little thing or if you aren't seeming as confident in the video, then they're not gonna be as willing to trust what you're saying. So I think just for the sake of persuading and arguments, um, I think really being able to have high credibility and trust in your sources and your whole speech will make the whole persuasiveness way more effective. One of the three tools that we can use in persuasive speech is pathos. Pathos means an appeal to emotion. To persuade an audience through their emotions can be a really strong tool because emotions tend to drive us. This can happen every single day. How often have boredom, exhaustion, or sadness led you to take a nap, call up your friend, or binge watch Netflix for hours? On the other hand, a drive for passion and happiness and excitement can lead us to go out and do things to make a difference in the world. When we use pathos, we strive to make the audience feel pity, sadness, excitement, or anger about our chosen topic. This encourages them to do something to make a change, even though, even if they didn't originally have a reason to do so. Many of our emotions are triggered by experiences and stories. So these can be a very good way to include pathos in your speech. There are lots and lots of examples of pathos being used in our everyday lives to persuade us to um, have some sort of change of mind or to take some sort of action. But I thought of two example speeches that I think do a really great job of using emotional appeals to move their audience to action. 
Um, so I want to take a look at just a couple sections of these speeches and then we'll go into how and why they're effective in their um, pathos, in their um, emotional appeal. So the first speech that I thought of was a classic. Um, it's Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. Um, and here are the sections that I want to go over. He says, I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the South with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with a new meaning, my country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. So it is through Martin Luther King's use of language like faith and together and us and we, it's his um, religious and patriotic appeals, and also this illustration of this dream he has, this hope of a new united nation that he's able to call the nation to change, to um, call for action and motivate us, right? He's making us feel something, which is making us want to do something. Um, in my second example, it's kind of a contrasting idea. Um, it is Greta Thunberg's speech that she gave at the UN Climate Action Summit. Um, but she's appealing to completely different emotions using sort of the same idea. So she's going to make us feel something, which should hopefully make us do something. So she says, You have stolen my dreams of childhood with your empty words. We are in the beginning of a mass extinct extinction, and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? You are failing us. The eyes of all future generations are upon you. And if you choose to fail us, I say, we will never forgive you. So just like Martin Luther King, um, Thunberg is appealing to our, emotion, our emotions by telling the story of dreams that she has. But instead of these dreams kind of coming to life, um, like in Martin Luther King's speech, she's talking about how they're being crushed. She's appealing to our um, emotions of anger and fear instead of, of hope and unity like Martin Luther King. So even though they are using emotional appeals in a completely different way, the goal is the same to, you know, call the nation, call the world, the globe, whatever, to some sort of change of mind or some sort of action. Um, again, emotional appeals can be used in a lot of different ways. You can use it for excitement, anger, fear, hope, pity, sadness, happiness. Um, but regardless of what emotion is being used, it should be used to drive your audience to your goal, to your purpose. Okay, so the third tool for persuasion that we're going to talk to you guys about today is called logos and it essentially means an appeal to logic or reason. Um, so I'm going to give you the like dictionary definition of logos, which says that logos is a rhetorical device that means any content in an argument that is meant to appeal to logic. So it includes all of your argument, not just a specific section of your paper or your speech. Um, it's used in rhetoric, so it can be used in writing as well as in speaking. But it's really important to remember that it, this um, rhetorical tool is used throughout your speech. It's not just one section. Um, the reason behind this is that your audience really needs to believe that what you want them to believe is reasonable and is logical and will fit into their life. And if you can't get your audience to believe that, then... Um, they're going to walk away from your speech wondering why you were talking about what you were talking about. Um, so just, this is where a lot of audience adaptation comes in because sometimes even though, um, an argument may seem common sense and logical to us as a speaker, it can be really hard to translate that to our audience. Um, because we have different life experiences than some of the members of our audience do. So it's just important to remember that even though something may seem logical to you, it may not seem as logical to your audience. So like I said, this is where a lot of your audience adaptation is going to come in and you guys are really good at that by this point in the semester and you know your labs and the people there pretty well. And so, um, it sh you should be fine. Just remember that and remember, um, that you also need to continue using ethos and pathos 
Um, sometimes we fall into a trap of just letting logic and reason take over and saying, oh, well, it's reasonable that you believe me and so you will. But we still need to be, you know, making those appeals to ethics and to emotions as well. So don't forget that. But here is an example of Logos. To stick with the trend that we've had throughout the entire lecture, I want to take one more look at Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. Um, as Sarah mentioned, Logos is a tool that should be woven throughout your entire speech. However, for the sake of the lecture, we are going to take a look at just one more section. Um, it is a little bit lengthier of a section, but I think Martin Luther King does a really fantastic job of establishing logic and reason to move his audience to a change of mind, to a state of action. Um, so just bear with me as I read through it. He says, Five score years ago, a great American, in whose symbolic shadow we stand, signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon of light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. But one year later, 100 years later, we must face the tragic fact that the Negro is still not free. When the architects of our Republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men would be guaranteed the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, which has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the Bank of Justice is bankrupt. So Martin Luther King does a really fantastic job of appealing to his specific audience's voice of reason and logic. So his audience obviously is the American nation, the American people. So what he does is he is appealing specifically to them by talking about the founding fathers of the U.S. and the um, truths that the nation was built on, which are those inalienable rights. Um, by basing his um, entire argument on the fact that these aren't being delivered and creating this dissonance in his audience, he is moving them to this um, state of action, this change of mind, which is the entire goal that he had. And what ends up happening, as history shows, is um, America changed as we knew it. It's completely different now. Um, and the entire, the entire argument is based on the fact that there's a lapse in logic, there's a lapse in reason from the Declaration of Independence and the Emancipation Proclamation.